Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am Jonathan Brent, uh, Executive Director of the Evo Institute for Jewish Research. And it's a real pleasure, a real honor uh, to welcome Lawrence H. Summers uh, to speak on the subject of academic freedom and anti-Semitism this evening. Uh, one might be tempted to say that everything um, at and associated with the Evo Institute is connected in one way or another with the subject of anti-Semitism, from the pogroms in Poland, Ukraine, and Russia, to Nazi propaganda, the Holocaust, from Evo's copious immigration files, to the deaths of most of Evo's founders and the very transition of Evo to the United States of America in 1940. But this is to limit and grossly distort Jewish history, the nature of the Evo Institute, our holdings and our mission and our activities. The genius of Evo is that it collected everything, studied everything, was interested in every manifestation of Jewish life in Eastern Europe and Russia and beyond, from the sacred to the profane, from rare rabbinical texts to Grossinger's resort, from family records to the, fam to the Balfour Declaration, and from there to the Yiddish theater. If Evo teaches anything, it is the lesson of perspective and finding the right place. Yet the place of anti-Semitism in the consciousness and experience of the Jewish people across the ages and across the globe cannot be denied or minimized. Our institutions of higher education are bastions of democratic liberal values and at the core of liberal society. And the lecture we will hear tonight suggests how great the political pressure of present political circumstances are on these values and institutions and how this age-old subject of anti-Semitism has taken on yet another new life under these new circumstances. We are most fortunate to have with us one of America's most influential and respected thinkers. Lawrence Summers is the Charles W. Eliot University Professor and President Emeritus at Harvard University. He served as the 71st Secretary of the Treasury for President Clinton, the Director of the National Economic Council for President Obama, and as the Chief Economist of the World Bank. Summers is a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and recently co-chaired the Commission on Inclusive Prosperity. He also recently chaired the Commission on Global Health, lauded by the UN Secretary General. Summers' wide influence in shaping American economic policy and social thinking has been recognized by Time, Magazine, Foreign Policy, Prospect, and The Economist, among many other uh, publications. Before we begin, I would like to say that if you are interested in learning more about the Evo Institute and our vast collections, our purpose, and our activities, there is uh, much literature on the table outside. Uh, I urge you to become members and help support us in our work, which is making lectures like this evening possible. Thank you. Jonathan, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for those warm words of uh, introduction. As uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, said at moments when he was introduced so warmly, I wish my parents had been here for that. My father would have appreciated it, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> and that is especially true of my Jewish mother. I am, uh, this is not uh, the usual venue of an economist uh, like uh, myself. I am glad to be here because through the involvement of my wife, uh, Lisa New, who is a member of the 
Nevo board, I have come to understand just how important the work of YIVO is in preserving the traditions of our people. It is a commitment to the preservation of tradition that has been an important reason why the Jewish tradition has continued for 3,000 years, and if, as I expect, it continues for 3,000 more years, it will be because of a commitment to the work of preserving that tradition. And so each of us, as we go about our everyday lives, should I be, should I believe, be very, very glad that institutions like YIVO uh, exist to maintain, preserve, support, and develop our tradition. And I've also gotten to know you, uh, Jonathan, and uh, in a life that's gone on for some time uh, now, I have been privileged to know many who lead nonprofit institutions with important missions that are important to their society. And I know of none who lead their institution with more commitment, more wisdom, and more deep sense of ultimate purpose than you do, Jonathan. And YIVO is very, very lucky uh, to have you. Now, you might ask, um, why is somebody who usually talks about the future of the dollar or whether there will be a uh, recession or what the impact of technology is on employment uh, here uh, tonight. It is because I have spent my life in universities, because I believe universities are profoundly important institutions because they do what is ultimately most important in any society. They teach, develop, and influence people at the most malleable point in their lives between the ages of, say, 18 and 25. And because they are charged with developing the new ideas and the new doctrines that ultimately shape uh, history. Paul Samuelson was right when he said that he would be happy to let anyone else be the finance minister of any country if he could write the economics textbooks that the students read. And Isaiah Berlin was right when he said that nations fell because of ideas developed by professors in the quiet of their study. And so what happens in universities is profoundly important, not in an hour or a day or a week or a month, but ultimately for the development of societies and for the development of the world. Henry Kissinger was wise in many things, but he was wrong when he said that the fights were so vicious because the stakes were so small. Or at least he was partially wrong because some of the fights are very vicious over things where the stakes are very small. But sometimes the stakes are very large. And it is an aspect of what is going on in universities. Their response to the challenges in the Middle East, their response to debates over the state of Israel that are of great concern to me, have been for some time, and cause me to be here tonight. My wife, uh, last March, came back from spending 10 days 
as a visiting scholar at Hebrew University. She described many aspects of that experience, but there was one aspect that she described that made the greatest impact on her and had the greatest impact on me. She talked about how she prepared to give a lecture to a group of Israeli scholars, graduates and undergraduates, on various topics in American literature. Franklin, Hawthorne, Melville, Faulkner, Dickinson, and so forth. But she described to me how, while she had been introduced many, many times, as I have, for the first time, the person who introduced her had a tremble in her voice, reflecting great emotion as she introduced Lisa. That was not, I have to confess, a reflection of Lisa's personal greatness. It was a reflection of what Lisa's presence met. For all the scholars and students in that room had been recently informed that the American Studies Association, the group that oversaw and supported professional scholars studying America, a group that, whose work had engaged Israeli scholars and Arab scholars, and Israeli and Arab scholars working together on a common interest of understanding America, that that group had been informed that the American Studies Association, an organization of thousands of American scholars that included among its members dozens, if not hundreds, of American universities had voted to ban scholarly exchange with scholars in Israeli universities. The American Studies Association was the largest such association, but it was not the only such association. The African Literature Association, the Association for Asian American Studies, the Association for Humanist Sociology, the Critical Ethnic Studies Association, the National Association of Chicano, Chicana and Chicano Studies, the Native American and Indigenous, Indigenous Studies Association, the Peace and Justice Studies Association, United Auto Workers Local 285, seeking to organize the teaching fellows at Berkeley, a thousand anthropologists making a proposal to the American Anthropological Association, all called for the boycott of Israel. I think it is outrageous. I think it is dangerous. I think it demands a much stronger response from the American academic community than it has yet received. And that is why I am here tonight. And if I had any doubt about whether I should be here tonight, if I had any doubt about whether anti-Semitism was a continuing threat, if I had any doubt about whether these were small issues, 
That doubt was resolved when I entered to give the lecture. I walked up to what looked to me like the door. That door was not open. Instead, I was instructed that I had to go through the visitor's entrance, and that was because Yivo had taken a precaution that I am sure was prudent to take, which was to require that we all go through a metal detector before coming into this building. Think about it. I'm used to having to go through metal detectors at airports. Having worked in the White House, I am used to going through metal detectors to go into meetings where the President of the United States is speaking. But you can go to any citadel of capitalism in this city without walking through a metal detector. You can go to almost any church in this city without walking through a metal detector. You can go to almost any mosque in this city without walking through a metal detector. And yet, prudence demands a metal detector here at YIVA. And that speaks to the continuing challenge and the continuing importance of anti-Semitism as an issue. Now, I will come back in just a moment to talk about what the response has been and what I think the response perhaps uh, should uh, be to the question of this boycott and other provocations uh, like it. But first, I want to make two other observations that I think are helpful in framing the issue and in considering the response. The first is to ask the question, well, isn't there a difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? Isn't there a difference between disagreeing with Israel and being anti-Semitic? And here would be my answer. There is nothing anti-Semitic about disagreement with the policies of the state of Israel. Lisa and I certainly do not support the current settlements policies of the state of Israel, certainly do not support the policies that the state of Israel has taken with respect to U.S. domestic politics, and do not see the issues surrounding Iran in the same way that the current government of Israel does. And in my view, to suggest that that disagreement would render us anti-Semitic would be absurd. On the other hand, on the other hand, I believe that the State Department of the United States, which has, publishes a report each year on anti-Semitism, got it about right when they wrote, while criticism of, of Israel cannot automatically be regarded as anti-Semitic, Rhetoric that applies double standards to Israel 
crosses the line of legitimate criticism. And I would ask you the question. I would ask you the question that those Israeli scholars asked my wife about the American Studies Association. They told her that they didn't approve of many of the policies of the government of Israel. In fact, they took her on a tour of what they regarded as the most outrageous bits of settlement expansion that could not be described as natural and organic growth. And they noted that no one in Israel tried to stop them from protesting in that way. That no one in Israel tried to stop them from speaking out against the policies of the Israeli government. And they noted that in Israel's own region of the Middle East, there were more than a dozen governments where you would pay for you with your life for the kind of protests they engaged in every day, and that the American Studies Association was not boycotting a one of those countries. And so that is a double standard. And that kind of double standard represents anti-Semitism. Does anyone doubt for a moment, for a moment, that if somehow the idea was concocted that a particular African country should be boycotted, when there was nothing about the conduct of that African country that distinguished it from a dozen other countries outside of Africa. That if that happened, it would be labeled as racist. Of course it would. And in the same way, the singling out of Israel, I would suggest, should be labeled for what it is, anti-Semitism. Now, a second question one might raise, and it's one that I have more sympathy with in at least trying to understand the different perspectives on these issues, is what about just the idea that everybody should be allowed to advocate what they want, do what they want, say what they want, and that is all in the name of academic freedom? And that while I may disapprove of it, it is itself an application of academic freedom for the American Studies Association to say we don't want to deal with Israeli scholars, so we don't have to deal with Israeli uh, scholars. That is another question one can raise. I think in approaching that question, one place to start, though certainly not to finish, is with some understanding of prevailing norms in at least some parts of academia. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, and the story I'm going to tell you is not typical, and it, it, it does leave an exaggerated impression, but it does not leave an impression that is 100% false. The nation's largest university system is the University of California at Berkeley, University of California system. It has nine universities and dozens of colleges. The chancellor of that system wrote a letter to all the faculty in that system, tens of thousands of faculty members, encouraging them to attend seminars where they could learn how to speak and write in ways that were appropriate, in ways that 
did not trigger people on their campuses. And in those seminars, there were examples given of offensive speech that would be triggering. Men and women have equal opportunities for achievement. Asserting that proposition was deemed to be triggering. Everybody can succeed in the society if they work hard enough. That was deemed to be triggering. All of humanity is one race. That was deemed to be triggering. And my favorite example, again, this came from the chancellor of the university in seminars that were being sponsored, was America is the land of opportunity. Now, this is not typical. The chancellor, no doubt, did not know exactly what was going on in these seminars. These are a few examples that a journalist picked out and there were many other examples that were offensive. And all of us who work with young people do need to be aware of what their sensitivities and sensibilities are. And there are certainly phrases that we all would have used 20 years ago that we would not use today. But I would suggest to you that in a campus culture, where it is contemplatable to suggest that saying America is a land of opportunity is somehow outrageous and wrong, that it is fair to expose to scrutiny the behavior of members of faculties who drive academic boycotts of the state of Israel. And it is fair, I would suggest, to ask of university administrations, what are they going to do to respond to this outrage? This outrage perpetrated by organizations of which they are a member. And so the question arises, what is the right way, what is the right way to respond? Now I've talked about boycotts by scholarly associations. That's not the only example. Universities with increasing frequency find themselves lending their name and their sponsorship to conferences in which the legitimacy of Israel as a state is challenged. I would suggest to you that while anyone is free to hold any opinion they wish, no member of a university community has the right to arrogate the prestige of the institution behind their personal view. And when there is the Harvard University Conference on X, that is what someone is doing. Pressure for symbolic economic sanctions mounts and occasionally succeeds. As one example, Harvard's dining service, in a decision that was apparently not reviewed at any senior level, bowed to a pressure from a small group of students to stop purchasing soda dispensers that had been manufactured in occupied parts of the West Bank. Anecdotal reports suggest that swastika, gra swastika graffiti, comparisons between Israel and the Nazis, and the intimidation of Jewish students have never been so great. There are other examples. Students seeking positions in student governments at UCLA and other universities have been asked whether they could make objective decisions given that they were Jewish. 
proposals that the university divest any company doing business in Israel were passed by Stanford student government and the Student Government Association representing Princeton graduate students and many other universities as well. What's been the response of universities to these provocations? To be fair, they have rejected boycotts like those of the American Studies Association. Typical statements are something like, such boycotts threaten academic speech and exchange, which is our solemn duty as academic institutions to protect. Or in the words of William Bowen, the former Princeton uh, president and a revered senior academic leader, boycotts are a bad idea. It is a dangerous business and basically unwise for institutions to become embroiled in these kinds of debates. The consequences for institutions are just too serious. I do not believe this is the right response to academic boycotts of Israel or responses in parallel are the right response to the other provocations I have described. There are two problems with this line of argument. First, it's too broad. Is it really true that always academic boycotts are inappropriate? Should American universities have cooperated fully with Nazi universities and loyal Nazi scholars in the 1930s? Would a university that indicated that while individual scholars were free to do what they pleased, it would not invite members of the Ku Klux Klan to speak in its civil rights lecture series be doing something wrong? Are not de facto boycotts a regular part of academic life? Astronomy departments boycott astrologers. Biology departments boycott creationists. Philosophy departments, almost without exception, boycott Ayn Rand disciples. <laughs> the problem is not with the idea of a boycott. The problem is with the moral outrage that this boycott represents and its anti-Semitic character. Second, it misses the point. For some reason, for the same reason that those who propose to divest all assets of universities that invest in Israel are doing something that's anti-Semitic, the academic boycott of Israel and universities and scholars from no other country is also anti-Semitic in effect and quite likely in intent. It seeks to demonize only the Jewish state. It is, if you listen to the titles of all the associations I listed, it is unrelated to the expertise of any. What should university presidents have said? If I had been a university president, I would have said something like this. The decision of the American Studies Association, supported by a member, supported by a majority of its membership, to single out Israeli institutions and Israeli scholars for selective boycott is abhorrent. The university believes it is very dangerous for scholarly associations to insert themselves into political issues outside the range of their competence. While individual members of the faculty are free to do as they wish, the university is withdrawing its institutional membership in the American Studies Association. 
we will withdraw from any scholarly association that engages in similar boycotts. Such statements, which have been conspicuously missing in American academic life, would, in my view, bring moral clarity where it is currently missing. The problem is not primarily that some exchanges are not taking place. Lisa was happy to go to uh, Israel. It is that the American academic community is being implicated in uniquely persecuting the world's only Jewish state, whose sins that even on the least sympathetic reading are small compared to those of many other nations. In the same vein, I believe that universities should make clear that their names cannot be invoked as the purported sponsor for conferences or dialogues in which the primary thrust is the demonization of Israel. When errors happen, they should be called out clearly and it goes without saying that they should not allow themselves to be used as economic leverage against Israel. Does any of this matter? How important is any of this? We can hope, we can expect that these are isolated outrages. And certainly, it would be wrong to take away the impression that most faculty members or most universities are persons or institutions of ill will. But I would also suggest that in this era of increased awareness of the dangers of demonization of any group, that this is a dangerous and disturbing trend. It is a dangerous and disturbing trend in universities. It is a dangerous and disturbing trend when the Presbyterian Church votes to divest itself of economic assets in uh, Israel. And that, yes, academic freedom is a very, very important thing, but that academic freedom does not include freedom from criticism, and that these outrages should be criticized much more vigorously than they have been in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Larry, uh, for the wonderful lecture. We will now have a question and answer uh, period. Uh, I will be up here uh, to make sure that um, if there are firebombs, I will get in the way of them. Uh, but uh, for the most part, I think uh, Professor Summers can answer on his own. Yes, sir. No, no, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll call on you next, but I called on the guy in the middle. Of doubt as to the power of words, but it seems to me in Rwanda and places all over the world, we've seen demonization precede enormous massacres of up to a million people or, or more, and there would be countless examples of that. And it seems to me that the response to this situation needs to face that fact very, very squarely. And this tendency is similar to what happened in Nazi Germany, that things went in steps with words preceding uh, massacres in the Holocaust, and that you cannot uh, have that kind of neutral attitude 
but rather that one must squarely recognize that this can lead to mass slaughters. I had a um, I had a feeling as I was thinking about coming here that there might be some reactions like yours. Um, I have had some experience saying things like the things that I just said on the Harvard campus or some months ago at a symposium at Columbia on academic freedom. And on all the previous occasions when I have said things of this kind to a very different kind of audience than is gathered here, the reaction has been that I overstated things, that I was making things more serious than they actually were, that I needed to maintain some sense of perspective. And you're really saying the opposite. You're really saying that I have underestimated uh, the threat, that I have not seen the gathering storm. And you may be right. And I don't want to say that you're not uh, right. And it's not an accident that I've chosen to speak several times about these matters in the last year and had not sp chosen to speak about them for, I spoke about them some years ago at Harvard, but I let several years go by without addressing these issues. And that's because my sense of the danger has increased in the last uh, couple of uh, years. On the other hand, and I've made a judgment, and maybe it's the wrong uh, judgment, but that my ability to speak to these issues probably is greater because this is not what the center of my life has been about center of my life has been about economics, it's been about uh, public, it's been about uh, public service. I have been fortunate. Uh, my family was far less touched by the Holocaust than uh, so many others. My life experience has not included incidents where I was myself a victim of uh, anti-Semitism. And so I speak to these issues as someone who I hope conveyed some real moral passion about them, but not as someone for whom this set of issues is defining of my identity. And I do so in the theory that by speaking that way, there may be people who are willing to hear me say that this is a serious problem, who would have more difficulty hearing someone who was more deeply rooted uh, in these concerns uh, than I am. But I take very seriously what you say, and I would not want to dispute uh, what you are saying. Yes. I've been on the faculty. I've been at the faculty of Columbia for the last thirty years, and I have watched in horror this deterioration um, from over these last three decades, this absolute deterioration. And I think the thing that is so difficult and hard for us to get our minds around is that the faculty members that I know that participate in these kinds of boycotts and these kinds of votes um, are not 
rabid anti-Semites of the 1930s type. They are most of the time actually people who identify themselves with the anti-bias world. They see themselves as fighting the good fight. They see themselves as part of a progressive ideology. And I think that if one has read progressive journals such as The Nation over the last 20 years, then there's no surprise um, because, because the, the academic discourse um, has taken on this demonization of Israel over, over all of those years. So it's precisely the people that we've always identified with um, that now seem on the other side, and I think it requires, I'm wondering what you think of in terms of how does one uh, create a new strategy for that paradox. I don't know the answer to your question. It, it's been said that the Fabian tendency is now to be anti-Israeli. And that's a way of capturing the idea that that's where the left uh, is. And I think it has several components. Um, one, I think there is a streak, uh, there's a very strong streak of anything that has any sense of connection to the idea of imperialism has to be wrong. And it doesn't matter what standards of living in the Palestinian areas are compared to in the refugee camps in Arab countries. It doesn't matter what civil rights Israeli Arabs have compared to um, minorities in other countries in uh, the Middle East. Anything that has an imperial, anything about it, which is a possible connection is just wrong. And I think that's what, it's not what I believe, but it's what many people believe. And I think that's a contributor to it. I think it is all, I think one does have to recognize, and I am not a close student of the peace process. Um, I, can, I can speak with what Lisa tells me is infinitely boring nuance about uh, exchange rates but I can't speak with similar nuance about uh, the West Bank and the occupied territories and the division of Jerusalem and so forth. But I think it is probably fair to say that a sense that Israeli positions have hardened very substantially has contributed to the developments that we are describing. And I think that I don't, I think uh, the reflex to symmetry in perceiving the conflict is wrong. It's not close to right. Uh, as best I can tell, all the terrorist bombs are done by one side against the other side. Terror There's nothing two-way about uh, the terrorism. Nonetheless, I think it is fair to say, and I think it is got to be one of the major challenges for Israel as it thinks about its strategy, that even within the uh, Jewish community, its positions are seen as less totally clear in their virtue than they once were. And I hope it's, could not, I hope I made it as, I made it as clear as I know how to make something clear that uh, I had no intellectual patience with these boycott movements. But I think in thinking about the broad context, I think one does need, one cannot entirely divorce the erosion of support for Europe, uh, in Europe for Israel, which is related to that Fabian tendency, on college campuses in the United States, which is related to that 
Fabian uh, tendency in other redoubts of the left uh, in the United States, which is related to that Fabian tendency, I don't think it can be divorced entirely uh, from uh, Israeli conduct. And that's something that in setting its strategy, uh, Israel has to contemplate. Yes. I happen to be also about 30 years ago student at the Brooklyn Poly. <laughs> at that time I already noticed groups of Arab student, perennial Arab student for 10 years, just boycotting, organizing, paying money. And the money issue is what's happening in my belief. Look at the five or six past presidents of the United States. All their fundings are infested with Arab money. And this propaganda goes on. It's something that goes worldwide. The, it's Arab money who are divesting, who are, who are creating this whole mess. And uh, little by little, from starting from the, from the lo low levels, from the students boo bo booing all the Jewish scholars on campuses, to, to the very, now the very top level, worldwide. And besides this, we are in the front of the third world war. Because, uh, let, me, let me go. No, no, let me, let me, resp let me respond. Um, look, I, I'm with you to a point. I'm not with you all the way. Um, I, I read, uh, when I was president of Harvard, a very powerful manuscript uh, called Pillars of Sand that described the development of Middle Eastern studies in the United States. And it described the development of Middle Eastern studies programs at universities in the United States. And I think the indictment you levy is a fair one. Uh, that there's substantial Arab money and they tend to come to substantially pro-Arab uh, positions. I don't think one can look at the funding of American political campaigns and say that somehow the um, Arab funding and the Arab support is somehow driving the position and that those sympathetic to Israel do not have influence in the American political process. I, I think if you believe that, you should attend um, an APAC uh, meeting. And while there are lots of aspects of APAC that can be debated, the question, has APAC had influence over the last 30 years? I don't think you'd want to argue uh, at least I don't think you'd be able to persuade me that APEC has not had substantial influence over the last uh, decades. One long 2,000-year-old chain. And I would like you also, if you would, to explain your views on Iran and why you think that it's unrelated to the extremist political The question, um, uh, when somebody asks a two-part question, I always like it because I think that maybe I'll know the answer to one of the two parts. <laughs> and after this gentleman asked the first part of his question, I held out hope for the second part. <laughs> but then we didn't get there on the second part either. Um, there were two parts of the question. The first was, um, what about Iran? And why am I saying anything good about the deal that was reached with Iran? And the first part of the question was, uh, is this a set of separate incidents or one 2,000-year chain of anti-Semitism? Look, with respect to Iran, it's a bad deal. The question is how the deal compares to the alternatives. And I believe that the alternative to this deal was a sanctions regime that would largely collapse within two years. So no sanctions on Iran, no eyes 
on Iran, because without the deal there'd be no inspections, and no support for the people in Iran who were trying to move nearer to rejoining the rest of the community. So I believe without this deal, we would have had a more intransigent Iran that was about equally economic, had about equal access to resources that we were in much less of a position to watch. And so we, we've worked ourselves into a terrible place vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but given the choices we had, I'm not convinced that we could do better. But look, reasonable people can certainly uh, disagree on the question. I wouldn't seek to vilify that, and I suspect if Prime Minister Netanyahu were here, he knows far more about it, and I wouldn't want to try to argue with him because I'm not sure I would win. Uh, uh, I rather doubt uh, that I would uh, that I would win uh, the argument. What I think is hugely important to my topic here tonight is that there is a tendency, and I think you just have to recognize it whether you like it or whether you don't like it, that if people have the idea that any criticism of Israel is going to be labeled as anti-Semitic and that you're not allowed to criticize Israel and that American Jews are people who think that Israel is always right, I think that is not going to be a, an environment in which any of us are going to succeed in achieving our objectives. And that's why I, descri that's why I saw fit in trying to place myself in a spectrum to describe Lisa and my views on Iran. But, you know, if, if we were talking about what the budget deficit should be, I would urge you to give, I would at least hope that you would give a lot of weight to my views. Uh, with respect to uh, Iran, I'm a hopefully knowledgeable observer, but it's not what I spend my professional life studying. Um, look, with respect to um, anti-Semitism, uh, anti I feel even, and it's 2,000 year history, speaking here at YIVO, I would guess that there are 100 people in this room at least who are infinitely more knowledgeable than I and uh, certainly uh, Jonathan is. Uh, I, I think that calling it one long chain feels wrong, suggesting that it's a random accident that keeps coming about also feels wrong. And so I think there are historic patterns and historic cycles that repeat themselves um, with all too much frequency, but I'm not sure I would go quite as far as to describe it as one long chain. Yes, sir. last two years of concern, substantial concern, about the way Harvard was using the name of President Lowell very freely in making the good points about Harvard stand out. Namely, in both cases, the relation between the students and the professors as a means of learning as compared with professor and student students could, could provide with other students the nece necessary basis for an examination of what's good about Harvard. But the problem was that Dean Smith, two years ago, decided that he would use the name of Professor Lowell, President Lowell, in, in order to achieve the idea that Harvard really respects the rights of students and the relation of professors. But the problem with that was that there was no basis for using the name of a, of a president let, of a college who let was me, uh, highly anti-Semitic. I think I understand where you're going. Let me, let me respond. Look, it's a, it's a very difficult issue. I mean, there's no question that Harvard has had um, 
at points in its past, quotas on the number of Jewish students who could be admitted. There's no question that there were various kinds of anti-Semitism practiced at Harvard for long periods in Harvard's history, and there's no question that those um, practices were sanctioned and supported by people who were president of Harvard. And so the question of how Harvard should regard those presidents is a real one. I guess I would say to you that there would be a position that would say we shouldn't have a Washington Monument or a Jefferson Memorial because they both own, because they both own slaves. And there would be a kind of logic and force to that position. But somehow we as a country make a judgment that in a full totality and understanding people in their historical context, it's not wrong to have a Washington Monument and to celebrate George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. And I think Harvard, on a much lesser scale, um, takes a similar kind of view in looking to its in looking to its president in looking to its past presidents. Yes. Uh, putting your economic hat back on for a second, Professor Summers. Uh, traditional or historically, there has been a correlation between periods of intolerance and periods of depression and periods of growing tolerance and periods of prosperity. And I would like to hear how you interpret the events we're talking about in respect of the economic environment. I think it's a good question. I think that, I don't think there's any question that if Germany did not have a pretty severe economic downturn, Hitler would not have been elected. And if Hitler's spending policies had not driven a pretty strong economic recovery in Germany, Hitler wouldn't have gained power and control over the society in the way he did between, say, 1931 and 1937. I don't think, though perhaps I should reflect more on the question, I don't, I mean, these have not been great years for uh, the American economy, and we had a downturn in 2009, and the economy has grown relatively slowly since. But if I ask myself why the American Studies Association is boycotting Israel, I don't think at root it's got much to do with the fact that the United States had a slow economy in, uh, 20, uh, in uh, 2014. I think that, you know, of all the jobs you can have that are kind of insulated from the economy, tenured professor is actually a pretty good one. And so, you know, times are pretty, times aren't that bad uh, for uh, professors. So I'd be a little, so I would be a little skeptical of uh, that kind of, of that kind of explanation. And look, I, I think you, I think you've got to recognize um, whether you look at the leaders of corporations or you look at the membership of the United, uh, membership of the United States Senate or you look at the people who are presidents of American uh, universities or you look at justices of uh, the, uh, justices of the Supreme uh, Court or you look at chairman of the federal chairman of the Federal Reserve, I think you have to recognize that while, I am describing a, I think, particularly pernicious thing that is going on within American university communities that you certainly wouldn't want to say that the right way to describe America in the 21st century was as a generalized wave of intolerance and, ex intolerance and exclusion uh, towards members of the Jewish faith. So I, I, I don't think I'd go with you quite on your recession theory. Yeah.
Do you think more than half the student body at Stanford and other colleges are really anti-Semitic? Um, two, do you think that this imperialistic sense that you've talked about is really the Palestinian play for victimhood and that they do so well in world media? And I got to ask you this. The right is considered very anti-science because they don't believe, quote unquote, in climate change. Do you think the left is also anti-science because they don't believe that the male and female brain could possibly be different? <laughs> Will it surprise you if I decide to stay away from the third question? <laughs> Look, there's, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there on the third, on the third question at all. And if I were inclined to, my wife would stand up and get on the stage, and uh, and stop me. Um, I don't know where half the Stanford student body is. I, I don't think that's quite the right way to think about it. I think what happened, and it, look, it's why I have insisted on using the word anti-Semitic, talking about the State Department definition, and developing the argument. I don't think they think they're anti-Semitic. They think they're fighting for a more reasonable outcome in a conflict between two countries by pressuring the one that's more amenable to pressure and for which they feel closer, and they don't think of themselves as anti-Semitic. And that's why when I first spoke about this issue in uh, 2002, I coined the phrase anti-Semitic in effect, if not intent, to make clear that the actions that some people were advocating would be anti-Semitic if they were actually done, but that the people themselves didn't really think of themselves as anti-Semites, and that's why I an important part of my speech and my argument in this area is to try to develop the idea that this really is a kind of anti-Semitism. But to say that it's a kind of anti-Semitism is not to say that the people are evil in the way that Hitler's stormtroopers uh, were evil. And I think it's important to be able to draw that, uh, uh, to be able to draw that distinction. I'm sorry, your second question was about what? Oh, uh, you know, uh, is it is it a reflection of Palestinian victim? Uh, you know, that's that's the phrases you choose if you approach it from a certain uh, a certain perspective. Do do Palestinians try to make the arguments that put their case with a maximum of sympathy? Yeah, they do. Um, which country doesn't? Um, who doesn't try to make their argument? in the way that will elicit uh, the, uh, the most sympathy. Uh, is it right? I mean, uh, Lee Bollinger, who's presided at Columbia, and there's a lot that goes on at Columbia, as the tone of my colloquy a little earlier suggests, there's a lot that goes on in Columbia's Middle East area, uh, Middle Eastern Studies Department, uh, that I loathe. Um, but, you know, he, he has said that the comparison of Israel with apartheid South Africa is, uh, I think his phrase was grotesque. Um, and I think he also used the word appalling, and I happen to think that judgment is correct. Yeah, in back. Yeah. can be doing to try and pressure university presidents to maybe have a more um, appropriate response? Look, I, um, I'm trying to think about what the right, how I want to answer, how I want to answer your question. I, I don't want to be, 
that it's not right for me. It's not right for me with respect to Harvard or other universities uh, to be somebody who incites people to do things. It's, you know, I try to lay out arguments and then people make their own choices. So I don't want to be heard uh, that way. As an observation about university presidents or members of Congress or cabinet secretaries, it is really quite surprising how much of a difference 12 pieces of mail will make. If the president of University X received 12 thoughtful one single spaced page letters saying that, you know, as an alum or as a parent or as a faculty member or as a whatever, they were deeply concerned. 12 letters that are generated from the heart, not generated as part of some campaign, that's a groundswell. And that will be noticed, that would be noticed, I learned when I was, I learned to my surprise when I was in Washington in a congressional office, and that would be noticed in a university. And so, you know, I, I think people who are concerned about these issues should talk about these, should talk about this as a, uh, as a, as a significant uh, concern. And what I have tended to be surprised by is with all the general entropy and so forth, it doesn't take that many people expressing concern thoughtfully to put any issue, whether it's having a, starting a new field hockey team or it's responding to this on a university administration agenda. Yes. Um, why you seemingly gave an out to some fields of academic study because they seemingly have more experience in the area. So. I can imagine that uh, an organization of organic chemists may have less to say about um, uh, anti-Semitism than other disciplines. But if you're going to give an out, for example, to critical studies departments or sociology departments or political theory departments as more knowledgeable about a subject matter, I think you leave a crack open rather than simply saying that bad behavior should be called out. And I'm just wondering when you were making that presentation whether you had considered that, um, the idea about more people closer to the subject matter versus people further away. I think it's a good, I think it's a, I think it's a fair, I think it's a fair question. Um, and I'm not sure I've got a, well-developed theory of it, and the, or that I can formulate one in the 45 seconds I'm going to talk about this. Um, but I, I think I'd say that, I think I'd say something like the following: In general, it strikes me as scholarly associations should be associations of individual scholars who put on meetings and let people debate and discuss things, and scholarly associations shouldn't, as associations take an opinion on any question. So I would have that view. On the other hand, if the Association of Atmospheric Scientists were to say that it was very concerned about global climate change and thought people should know that atmospheric scientists in general thought global climate change was a problem, I think on balance I'm against that because I think it would be better for individuals to do it. But it would be hard for me to be outraged um, by the Association of Atmospheric Scientists taking a position. So once I say that to myself, I then would say to myself, okay, if there's an association for the study of the West Bank and its members all come to a conclusion, well, you know, 
I may not agree with the conclusion, but I'm not an expert. I'm not a scholarly expert on it. And so I think it's hard to take an absolutist position that groups of scholars who are expert on something can't take an opinion on it and that if they do take an opinion on it, they can't share uh, the opinion. That doesn't mean that others can't be free to call it um, biased, inappropriate, wrong, shoddy, uh, terrible scholarship. But I think, but the reason I, uh, you know, I'm going to go away and think about your think about your question. But the reason I took the position I did was I sort of asked myself: Can the atmospheric scientists speak about atmospheric science? Yes. Can the Middle Eastern experts speak about the Middle East? It seems like the answer to that question might have to be yes. Uh, might have to be yes too. And that's why I came down where I came down. very spirited minority, very active minority. But could you quantify the atmosphere on campuses aside from that? For instance, what is the atmosphere on the 50 or 70 top academic uh, universities, and what would it be on the vast bulk of the hundreds of universities other than those? Look, I'm probably a little closer to this than the average person is in this room. But, you know, if I asked you what the sentiment was in New York City, you'd kind of have a hard time answering me. You could kind of say what the sentiment is among your friends and your neighbors and your colleagues at work. And, you know, like I'm, like there's one college campus I spend a bunch of time on. So I, I'm really hesitant about holding myself up as somebody who can, uh, who can answer uh, your, uh, your question. I think that there is a small, determined, focused, actively anti-Israel group on many college campuses. I doubt it's as many as 5% of the people. But remember what I said about the 12 letters. And... So a small minority that cares a huge amount will sound very large and can make a very big difference, particularly when there's a relatively apathetic majority. And I think there's another sizable group, I don't know whether it's a quarter or a third or a half, on many college campuses that doesn't really spend much time thinking about this, that doesn't really care that much about this, but when you say, well, Israel took over these lands in a war 50 years ago, they still hold these lands, they're building more and more settlements in these lands, and the people who live in these lands don't really get a vote, and they've kind of been colonized, and Israel shouldn't be colonizing another place, and so there ought to be a peace treaty, and if Israel were more reasonable, there would be. And yes, it's terrible that the other people are, commit acts of terrorism sometimes, but it's terrible. It's wrong that it's terrible that they're committing these acts of terrorism. On the other hand, the Israelis really are colonizers, and we don't like colonizers, and so Israel ought to change, so we ought to get Israel to change. That kind of seems reasonable to them. And so they aren't outraged by the 5%, and they have a certain amount of sympathy. And that would be a way of sort of characterizing the political dynamic. One last question? Yes. Tell you what, why don't we take these two and I will respond to both of them together. So the, I read controversy about Harvard Hillel, that they, they had tried to organize a seminar and they had been prevented from doing so or people had been, there had been opposition from the Hillel Oberlein group. To what extent is the problems that anti-Semitism on the campus a function or is it helped or hurt by what seems to be a hesitant or, or different 
hesitant response from Hillel either on the particular campus or generally Hillel in North America. My question is, is quite different, and that is this. We all accept that the American academe has been captured by the liberal mentality. It is left, and part intrinsic to that th thought process is victimization and the need for strong response to victimization. Now you and Alan Dershowitz suddenly find a single issue in this whole panoply of things which you disagree with. Why don't you show any introspection in this and come to the conclusion that maybe not only is that issue wrong, but the whole corpus is wrong, that the liberal left mentality is anathema? I used to work with, uh, many of you will remember him, uh, the late Senator Lloyd Benson, when he was the Treasury Secretary. And he once gave me a piece of advice. He said, whenever you speak to a group, never take the last question. <laughs> um, I'll come back to yours. Uh, I don't really follow, I, I haven't followed the, the nuances of the debates uh, in the Hillel, um, in the Hillel movement. You know, I think there's a, there's a complicated set of issues. On the one hand, you believe in free speech. On the other hand, it's kind of the idea in the Harvard English Department that we give talks in English and we don't have people come and give seminars about math because it's the Harvard English Department. And so, Hillel kind of has a similar sort of rule, which is we don't give talks calling for the end of the state of Israel. Not because, such, not because there isn't freedom of speech, but that's because it's, it's not what Hillel's do, just like English departments don't give math seminars. And that doesn't seem like an outrageous position for Hillel's to have. Obviously, there's a fine line between what is a talk saying that Israel shouldn't exist or be delegitimized, and what is a disagreement with Prime Minister Netanyahu? And you know, does some Hillel get that line right in every case? I wouldn't. I don't know what does has Harvard Hillel gotten it right in every case. I wouldn't presume to judge. You know, it's not. It was not my experience in five years as president of Harvard that my weakness was seen as being. Um, and excessive sympathy with the academic left. Um, that was not uh, the way in which I was um, usually, uh, usually criticized. So this is coming at me from a somewhat unusual, um, a, a somewhat unusual perspective. I guess I thought that when I, um, and my wife told me not to do it, but I did it anyway, um, when I talked about uh, the Janet Napolitano letter and uh, the seminars where people were told that they weren't supposed to say that America is a land of opportunity, I was trying to signal that I had a fair amount of sympathy with uh, many aspects um, of uh, your point of view. I do think that a real weakness of American universities, most American universities, is that on questions that are political, there is some lack, there is a real lack of uh, intellectual diversity. Um, I'm a Democrat, I'm a progressive, I'm proud to have worked for Democratic administrations, but you know, when I see that, when I see the figures suggesting that, you know, in the year 2000, Ralph Nader got more votes in the, from the Harvard faculty than George Bush did, um, I don't think that's very good. Um, I don't think that's, I think it's easy to say it's all terrible, it's all just a bastion of liberalism, they all just self-perpetuate, they discriminate against conservatives, it's all terrible. It's easy to kind of say that. 
I actually think it's a lot more complicated. Um, I think it's got something to do with the fact that um, people who like capitalism have lots of choices. They can work for companies. They can work for universities. There are a lot of places they can work. People who don't like capitalism <laughs> have fewer choices. And so it ends up that the people who are in universities are a higher fraction of the people who don't like capitalism than in the rest of the country. And it's kind of the way it works out. And you, you can't really blame universities for the fact that it's, uh, for the fact that it's true. Can I just, can I just say, um, just in conclusion, uh, Jonathan, um, thank you very much for having provided me this opportunity. Thank you for your leadership of uh, YIVO. Thank you to my wife, Lisa, who, if I sound thoughtful rather than reflexive on these issues, it is in substantial part due to her influence, and if I achieve any eloquence ever, that is also due to her influence in reforming a meat-eating, number-crunching um, economist. But mostly, thank you to everyone here for in what I think is the best of the kind of Jewish tradition that uh, YIVO carries on engaging in a really very thoughtful and spirited and challenging debate from which I've learned a lot. Thank you very much.